Move It On adds its tribute at this time of national mourning. The passing of King George VI came as a sudden and most grievous shock to his people all over the world and to all friends of the British Empire and Commonwealth. Signs of the deep mourning into which the nation had been plunged were to be seen everywhere. We all believed that his health had been improving, a fact that added weight to the blow when it fell. When King George V died in 1936, he was succeeded by King Edward VIII. Few could have anticipated then that the burden of kingship would so soon fall upon the Duke of York. Before the end of the year, however, he was king. In the spring of 1937 came the coronation. Pictures of that great event recall the scenes of his dedication to royal service on behalf of all his people. The magnificence of that solemn and historic occasion presents a vivid contrast to the simplicity of his family life, for this was one of quiet happiness with the Queen and their daughters, typified by this well-remembered film. But as for his subjects, so for the King and his family, war came to shatter the world for a second time. The King was untiring in his efforts to lend encouragement throughout the long years of struggle he stayed in his capital. His home indeed was a target for the enemy. Meanwhile, the princesses were growing up, as this delightful wartime record shows. At last, victory. Instinctively, tens of thousands turned to their majesties when they wished to express their relief and joy. The king and queen were indeed the head of the whole British family. Two years later, the king began what he intended to be a series of tours to the dominions. His visit to South Africa, however, was the only one that could be carried out. From Cape Town, he travelled throughout the Union, everywhere receiving a warmth of welcome that could only be evoked by the honour and affection in which he was held. In the following year, the King and Queen celebrated the 25th anniversary of their wedding. A national rejoicing brought this typical response from the king in a broadcast to his people. It has been an unforgettable experience to realize how many thousands of people there are in this world who wish to join in the thankfulness we feel for the 25 years of supremely so happy married life which had been granted to us. The birth of a son and heir to Princess, now Queen Elizabeth, was an event of the greatest happiness. Pictures taken at Prince Charles' christening included this group, four generations of the royal family. It was not long afterwards that the first news of the King's illness was given. All who saw him as he steadfastly continued his royal duties at this time could see how seriously it had affected him. But after rest and treatment, he improved, and at the time of the christening of Princess Anne, the king appeared to have made a recovery that we all prayed would continue.
But later, the King's sudden return from a holiday of recuperation in Scotland was coupled with the news that he was to undergo an operation on the lung. The news was grave. The nation waited in suspense as the course of his progress was made known. Once again, he seemed to be on his way back to health, and when he went to London Airport to say farewell to the Princess and the Duke, he appeared to be better than he had been for many weeks. affectionate farewells, though none could know it then, were the last farewells. How poignant now. They were flying to continue the Commonwealth tours that he was unable to fulfill. He went to Sandringham, where so soon afterwards he passed away peacefully in his sleep. For his consort, the deepest sympathy is felt by the nation. The nation mourns a king who served it so well.